Well, good morning. It is a privilege, it's a blessing to be able to serve the Lord Jesus here in such a beautiful part of his creation and to meet so many new faces, brothers and sisters in Christ that I haven't met before. So I'm very honoured and uh, to be part of this very special time of fellowship and teaching. And I trust that the Lord will minister to you. He is our good shepherd and he's in the midst of his flock, your part. We are part of that flock. And he knows where we're all coming from, not just the place that we've left to be here, but where we are with him, how we're feeling, the things that we are going on in our lives. And, and we pray above all else that our hearts will be inclined towards him. Uh, my name is Paul Wilkinson. I'm the associate minister of a very small fellowship called Hazel Grove for Gospel Church in a town called Stockport, just outside Manchester in the north of England. If you've been following the news, maybe you've seen some of the riots that's been going on the last few days in London and Birmingham and Manchester. So I'm missing out on all the, <laughs> well, on all the lawless action that's been taking place. And uh, I bring greetings from Hazel Grove for Gospel Church, all my brothers and sisters in Christ, my pastor Andrew Robinson, and uh, we pray that you will have a very blessed time in this conference. Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we worship you, we adore you, we thank you for the gift of life. We thank you most of all for the gift of eternal life through Christ Jesus, your beloved and only begotten Son. And we desire that the meditation of our hearts, the words of our mouths, Lord, would be pleasing in your sight. You are our God, the only true living God. And we just come weak and feeble, sinful as we are. Lord, we come in the grace and in the righteousness of our Lord Jesus. We come just wanting to bless you. Even as we heard in that beautiful song that began the conference, just wanting to bless your heart. And so, Lord, we just commit this Next session to you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Christian Palestinianism. This is not going to be the most edifying of sessions at the conference. So I'm looking more forward to sharing in the next two sessions. But things are happening and we need to be aware. Just a few weeks ago, a pop single was released in the UK charts by a gathering of musicians from around the world. They came together under the name One World. The title of the song is Freedom for Palestine. It's been endorsed by many Christian groups. It's been endorsed by Stop the War campaign and War Against, uh, Coalition Against the Iraq War and all kinds of organizations. And uh, it's even been endorsed on the Facebook page of Coldplay. I'm not into the music scene. I don't use Facebook. But Coldplay are one of the largest pop groups in the world today, and they have endorsed this single, the inspiration of which was Free Nelson Mandela, the song that was released in the 1980s. And uh, you're going to hear a little bit of this song right now. No matter your faith or community, this is a crime against humanity. Gods are turned into a prison camp. Apartheid war divides the West Bank. We are the people, and this is our time. Stand up, sing out. Occupation, violence and racial segregation All religious communities unite Freedom is a human right We are the people and this is our time Stand up Pick up some of the key words there, apartheid war, occupation, freedom for Palestine. I am proud to support freedom for Palestine by one world.
I urge everyone to buy the single and spread its message. Let's send a message to governments that a critical mass of people want to see an end to the Israeli occupation of Palestine and the oppression of its people. What is Christian Palestinianism? In essence, it is an inverted mirror image of Christian Zionism. A few key points here. Where the Bible is seen to be Christian, not Jewish. The church is the new Israel, not a new people. The land is Palestine, not Israel. The Holocaust is resented, not remembered. The 14th of May, 1948 is a catastrophe, not a miracle. The state of Israel is considered to be illegitimate, not prophetic. Israeli Jews are considered to be illegal occupiers. Bible prophecy is simply a moral manifesto, not a signpost to the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord Jesus is portrayed as being Palestinian rather than Jewish. This is Naim Atik. He is the founder of an organization called Sabil in Jerusalem. He founded that in 1994. Sabil represents the Palestinian Ecumenical Liberation Theology Center. If you can get your mind around that. But those words will tell you what this organization professedly a Christian organization, is all about. And I've described Naimatik as the chief architect of Christian Palestinianism. This is his first book, published in 1989, two years after the first Palestinian intifada, or uprising, that took place in Israel. The title of the book, Justice and Only Justice, A Palestinian Theology of Liberation. Naimatik is an Anglican clergyman formerly the canon of St. George's Cathedral in Jerusalem, and he took the writings of a Peruvian Roman Catholic theologian called Gustavo Gutierrez, who in 1970 published a book called A Theology of Liberation, in which he portrayed the Lord Jesus Christ as the great liberator of the poor and the oppressed of the earth. His most recent book is A Palestinian Christian Cry for Reconciliation. And just this one quote will sum up what Sabil and what Palestinian ecumenical liberation theology and Christian Palestinianism is all about. Naim Atik writes, Palestinian liberation theology focuses on the humanity of Jesus of Nazareth, who was also a Palestinian living under an occupation. In 2001, in his Easter message in Jerusalem, this is what Naimatik preached. Here in Palestine, Jesus is again walking the Via Dolorosa. Jesus is the powerless Palestinian humiliated at a checkpoint. The woman trying to get through to the hospital for treatment. The young man whose dignity is trampled. The young student who cannot get to the university to study. The unemployed father who needs to find bread to feed his family. In this season of Lent, it seems to many of us that Jesus is on the cross again with thousands of crucified Palestinians around him. It only takes people of insight to see the hundreds of thousands of crosses throughout the land. Palestinian men, women and children being crucified. Palestine has become one huge Golgotha. The Israeli government crucifixion system is operating daily. Palestine has become the place of the skull. Christmas Eve 2010, the Palestinian Media Watch uh, organization headlined, Jesus was a Palestinian, no one denies that, says Palestinian Authority Television. You see a caption there of Sami Ganadre, a Palestinian author, who said that Jesus was the first Palestinian Shahid martyr, those that blow themselves up in the name of the Palestinian cause. Sami Ganadre is not claiming to be a Christian. But I want you to watch a short extract from YouTube, an interview that was given with a man by the name of Mustafa Barghouti. He ran for president of the Palestinian Authority at the, at the same time of Mac as Mahmoud Abbas back in 2005. Unless you speak Arabic, you won't be able to understand, but the translation will be at the bottom of the caption. Listen to what he has to say. Jesus 
Jesus was the first Palestinian who was tortured in this land. Now you're going to hear from Sheikh Mohammed Hussein, the Grand Mufti, Muslim of Jerusalem. أن سيدنا المسيح عليه السلام ولد في هذه الديار ودرج في هذه الديار وبشر بدعوته في هذه الديار فهو وأمه يعني نستطيع القول أنهما فلسطينيان بامتياز. Jesus and his mother Mary were Palestinians par excellence. Okay, we might understand that the Muslim world wants to embrace Jesus and claim Jesus for themselves, but when the Christian community, when the church uses the same language, we know we are in trouble. Here is the Reverend Dr. Alistair Black. He is a Baptist pastor at Stirling Baptist Church in Scotland in the UK. Just before Christmas, he was invited to address the Scottish Parliament at Holyrood in Edinburgh. What a wonderful opportunity to bring a Christian message, a thought for the day before the Scottish Parliament convened. He spoke how he had just been on a sabbatical in, what, in Nablus, in what he called the West Bank, in Palestine, where he saw for himself what life was like for the Palestinian people living under occupation. And he was filled with hope because he met a man who took him to this place where he was running a circus for little children, teaching them how to juggle and all those kinds of things. And that filled him with great hope. And this is how he concluded his message before the Scottish Parliament. Immediately my despair was replaced with hope. Not because I believed the circus would change the world, or that teaching children to be clowns is the antidote to Israeli bullets and Islamic extremists. Now I found hope because I knew that as long as people believed, maybe naively believed, they could make a difference, the darkness would not overcome the light. And this is the hope of Christmas, that the birth of another Palestinian child who was born a refugee and subject to military oppression brought. As the Apostle John says, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. It is this belief, and some may say this naive belief, that the child that was born in Bethlehem offers a light to the world and a hope in our despair that no political, military or social power can match. And it is because of his birth that we can confront those situations of despair and hopelessness with the promise of hope, peace, and new possibility. This is the hope of Christmas, that another Palestinian child born a refugee under occupation. Christian Palestinianism is, in very essence, an interfaith movement within the church. Here is Stephen Sizer. He is an Englishman, an Ang Anglican evangelical vicar in the south of England. I've described him as the champion of Christian Palestinianism. The caption you can see was taken in 2007, October 2007. He was in front of the cameras of the Islamic Republic news agency in Tehran. This is what that news agency website reported. The British author Stephen Sizer said that the Zionists have distorted remarks by President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad about the Holocaust. Remember that Ahmadinejad denies the Holocaust and at the World Without Zionism conference that he hosted in Tehran in 2005, he said Israel should be wiped off the map. Stephen Sizer was blaming the Zionists and the Christian Zionists for distorting his remarks. How can an evangelical Christian defend such a man. Notice the little plaque standing in front of Stephen Sizer. It is a plaque of the Ayatollah Khomeini, the man who led the Islamic Revolution in Iran in 1979, which spread right throughout the Middle East. This is Stephen Sizer's published PhD thesis in 2004, Christian Zionism Roadmap to Armageddon, which was endorsed by Hank Hanegraaff, Tony Campolo, John Stott, very well-known evangelical leaders, teachers, and theologians. Many, many more Christian leaders have endorsed the writings of Stephen Sizer, and those writings condemn Christians for standing on the word of God in their support for Israel and the Jewish state. Stephen Sizer has followed up that book with another one entitled Zion's Christian 
soldiers, the Bible, Israel, and the church. There he is in Tehran, 2007, promoting his first book. There he is addressing Islamic scholars in Tehran. And notice once again the portrait of the man above Stephen Sizer's head, the Ayatollah Khomeini. The question needs to be asked, whose authority is Stephen Sizer acting under? Do you think he's proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ to these Islamic scholars? No, this is interfaith. This is compromise. This is bringing the church and Islam together. Here is Stephen Sizer receiving gifts from these two Islamic ladies. Okay, what's the problem there? Well, the lady on the left, her name is Zara Mostafavi Khomeini. She's the daughter of the Ayatollah Khomeini, the leader of the Islamic Revolution in 1979. And she is translating into the Persian language, Farsi, Stephen Sizer's book. That is the first evangelical Christian book to be translated into the Persian language. Here is Stephen Sizer giving a copy of his book to an Islamic cleric in Lebanon in 2008. And you saw a photograph in the background of Hassan Nasrallah, the leader of Hezbollah, that Lebanese terrorist organization. Here is Stephen Sizer in Libya, 2008, joined this time by Gary Burge, bottom left, and Donald Wagner to the right. If you don't know who they are, let me tell you. Donald Wagner is the director of the Center for Middle Eastern Studies at North Park University in Chicago. He's an ordained minister in the Presbyterian Church USA. He's on the board of trustees of the Council for a Parliament of the World's Religions. Gary Burge is the professor of New Testament at Wheaton College, Illinois. He's on the advisory board of the Holy Land Christian Ecumenical Foundation. He's also on the board of Evangelicals for Middle East Understanding, trying to bring the church in the West into relationship with the Arab world in the Middle East. There is Wagner, Sizer, and Burge at another interfaith evangelical Muslim dialogue conference that took place in Toronto, Canada in May last year. Here is Stephen Sizer. You're going to hear an interview that took place in Malaysia just back in June. He was invited to speak on behalf of Viva Palestina, Malaysia. Viva Palestina means long live Palestine. They're very much involved in the Gaza flotillas that you've been hearing about, these ships supposedly bringing aid to the Palestinian people. You'll have heard about that in the news. Listen to what Stephen Sizer has to say. I'm just going to back up. And so the idea of Zionism goes back to uh, empire building, colonialism, and, uh, and the concept of ethnically pure races. Uh, so it's a form of racism. And all the quote you've just given us from Netanyahu's speech, he's going back to the Bible to justify it. 3,000 years, 4,000 years. Mm -hmm. What about the people who've lived there since then yeah. who can also quote from the scriptures mm -hmm. about their justification for being there too? Mm -hmm. So Zionism is a form of racism today. Um, and, and Israel's really got to decide whether it wants to be an inclusive, um, uh, modern society that's multi-faith, uh, multi-ethnic, uh, just as Malaysia is, just as Britain is, or does it want to go down the route of South Africa and apartheid and separate whites from blacks? Zionism is a form of racism. That, in fact, was exactly what the United Nations stated in 1975 when they issued Resolution 3379 that was actually revoked in 1991. Notice how scoffing he was towards Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, because of the address he gave to the US Congress, in which he dared to quote the Bible in talking about the right of the Jewish people to the land of Israel. Viva Palestina has a branch here in the United States. What is the underlying theology of this Christian Palestinianist movement? How do they look at the Bible? Here is Elias Shakur. I've called him the godfather of Christian Palestinianism because all these guys we've looked at so far hold him in, in high esteem. He is the Vatican appointed Archbishop of Jerusalem. He belongs to what's called the Catholic Melkite Church. This is what he said in his book Blood Brothers published in 1983. 
We have been taught for centuries that the Jews are the chosen people. We do not believe anymore that they are the chosen people of God, since we now have a new understanding of chosenness. God isn't interested in one nation anymore. He's interested in all the nations. Well, there's an element of truth in there, but what he's doing is casting Israel aside and saying they are no longer significant as a people, as a nation, in the sight and in the purposes of God. Here are his books, Blood Brothers. We belong to the land Elisha, uh, Faith Beyond Despair, Building Hope in the Holy Land. These books have had a massive impact on the evangelical church, especially here in the United States. A British theologian by Colin Chapman in the same year, 1983, published this book, Whose Promised Land? Question mark. Questioning the long-held belief of the evangelical world that the land of Israel, the land of Canaan, was given to the Jews, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as an everlasting possession by virtue of an everlasting covenant. Men like Colin Chapman are questioning that. In fact, they're not questioning it, they're rejecting it. Chapman wrote, The New Testament writers cease to look forward to a literal fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies of a return to the land and a restored Jewish state. The one and only fulfillment of all the promises and prophecies was already there before their eyes in the person of Jesus. This is replacement theology, clothed in new garments. They don't like that term. They don't like being branded with that term replacement theology. So they use the term fulfillment theology. Everything has been fulfilled in Jesus. Well, Jesus says, I have come to fulfill the law and the prophets. Yes, through the Lord Jesus, all the promises and prophecies of God are fulfilled. But Jesus isn't Israel. Jesus isn't the land of Israel. Jesus isn't Jerusalem, as these men make out. This is their teaching. Justice and Owning Justice, back to Naimatik's first book. This was his new hermeneutic, his new approach to the Bible. Are you ready? Here we go. When confronted with a difficult passage in, passage in the Bible, for example, when God commands Joshua and the Israelites to encircle the city of Jericho and it falls down and the Lord says, go in and leave no one alive, not even the cattle, except for Rahab and her family. That is a difficult passage for Naimatik and for the Christian Palestinianists. So he says, when you're confronted with such a passage like that, one needs to ask such simple questions as this. Is the way I am hearing this, the way I have come to know God in Christ, does this fit the picture I have of God that Jesus has revealed to me? If it does, then that passage is valid and authoritative. If not, then I cannot accept its validity or authority. So he's got the picture of gentle Jesus, meek and mild, and the fall of Jericho does not fit his picture of God in Christ Jesus, and therefore he says, no, we no longer have to pay any attention to those scriptures. God has revealed himself in a very different way. Naimatik in a Palestinian Christian cry for reconciliation quotes another one of these so-called difficult passages, Isaiah 61, verses 5 to 6. A beautiful promise, a glorious hope for Israel beyond the tribulation when the Lord returns and restores the kingdom to Israel. Isaiah prophesied, Strangers shall, tend, shall stand and tend your flocks, Israel. You shall eat the wealth of the nations. God is going to raise Israel up to be the chief among the nations. We know that from Scripture. But this is what Naimatik says. This exclusivist text is unacceptable today. It must be de-Zionized. So any passage of Scripture that sets Israel apart for a glorious future has to be reinterpreted, de-Zionized. I don't know if you recognize this artist's impression. John Calvin. Christian Palestinianism is rooted in Calvinism. It is rooted in Augustinianism. It is rooted in amillennialism. It is rooted in replacement theology. 
And these men that we have looked at already, and the ones we're going to look at in a moment, all look to John Calvin, who said in his commentary on Acts 1, 6 to 8, remember the last question the disciples asked Jesus, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And the Lord said, it's not for you to know the times and seasons set by my Father's authority, but implicitly saying, that is exactly right. You've got the understanding right, but the timing is not for you to know of. You've got to be my witnesses. That is your preoccupation now. That's what you're to be focused on. Be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And in the Father's timing, the kingdom will be restored to Israel. A child would understand that. That is how the scripture reads. That's not how John Calvin, Jean Chauvin, that's his exact, his actual name, because he was French, a reform in the early 1500s. This is what Calvin said on that passage. He said that there were, quote, as many errors as words in the apostles' question. And this, Calvin believed, proved, quote, how bad scholars they were under so good a master. And so that when Jesus said, you shall receive power, what he was doing was admonishing the disciples for their imbecility. Okay, let's bring this up to the present day. Let's hear Donald Wagner, evangelical, Presbyterian, in the spirit of John Calvin, commenting on this verse. I can see Jesus saying half in jest and half seriously, I don't believe it. Where have you people been for the past three years? This is to the disciples. You've missed the point of everything. Then Jesus became very harsh with the disciples. This is a clear word from the Lord to the futurist dispensationalists. Here Jesus was telling the disciples not to place their trust in, nor devote their energy to end time prophecy or the militant Zionist ideology of the zealots. Anybody heard of Bishop N.T. Wright? Up until the summer of last year, he was the Bishop of Durham within the Anglican Church there in the UK. That is a poisoned chalice. One of his previous um, incumbents denied the resurrection and the virgin birth and, and so on. He is a heavyweight in the academic world. He can run rings around you academically. Very, very clever man, but very, very, very wrong. But here are some of his disciples. You might recognize them. Stephen Sizer, Gary Burge, Naima Teek, Hank Hanegraaff. All these men and many more refer to Bishop N.T. Wright and the debt they owe to this man. For publishing books like these, The New Testament and the People of God, Jesus and the Victory of God. If you've got a month to spare, then you may be able to get through these huge tomes. But I'm just going to try and summarize what N.T. Wright is saying about Israel. He said that the Lord Jesus was reconstituting Israel around himself, reinterpreting Israel's eschatological hope, reusing Israel's prophetic heritage and retelling its story, and redefining what the kingdom meant. You got that? You understand what he's saying there? No, neither did I when I first read it. You have to read and read and read over again. But let me sum it up in one sentence. From Jesus in the Victory of God, 2001. N.T. Wright said, The promises to Jerusalem, to Zion, are now transferred to Jesus and his people. To Jesus and the church. In other words, Israel's finished. Christian Palestinianism is a propaganda machine. They are producing, churning out book after book after book to get their message across. Here are some of them. The Dark Crusade, Christian Zionism and U.S. foreign policy. Faith Lembrace, Christians, Jews and the search for peace in the Holy Land. Peace or Armageddon, the unfolding drama of the Middle East Peace Accord. Anxious for Armageddon. The word Armageddon appears in many of the titles of these books. Because what the Christian Palestinianist wants to do is say that you and I, who stand with Israel, we're not interested in the Jewish people. We're certainly not interested in the Arab world. All we care about is World War III, Armageddon, and the second coming of Jesus. That's the caricature 
That's the straw man argument that's being portrayed through these books. It is proper gander. On the road to Armageddon, how evangelicals became Israel's best friend by Timothy Weber and a British journalist, Victoria Clark, allies for Armageddon, the rise of Christian Zionism. It gets worse. 1983, Yuri Davis, a Jewish author, now converted to Islam, wrote Israel, an apartheid state. Mm, now things are changing. Now this is getting very, very sinister. When you think apartheid, you think of which country? South Africa. Is apartheid a good word? No, it's universally an abhorrent word. So what they are trying to do is attach the label apartheid to Israel and get you to feel as, as angry and aggrieved by what Israel is supposedly doing to the Palestinians as how you felt when the South African apartheid regime was oppressing, oppressing the blacks. It is propaganda. A more recent book, 2010, again an English journalist, Ben White, Israeli Apartheid, A Beginner's Guide. Ben White is an evangelical Christian. There we go. Apartheid, wrong in South Africa, wrong in Palestine. Free Palestine, boycott Israel. Nelson Mandela in 1997 in an address at the International Day of Solidarity with the Palestinian people said this, the UN took a strong stand against apartheid and over the years an international consensus was built which helped to bring an end to this iniquitous system. But we know too well that our freedom is incomplete without the freedom of the Palestinians. B.D.S. Boycott, divestment, sanctions. This is the answer of the Christian Palestinianists to the alleged Israeli occupation of Palestine. I don't know about in the United States, but in the UK you will see posters and placards like these. Freedom for Palestine, boycott Israel, boycott Israeli potatoes, don't buy Israeli produce, support the Palestinians, boycott Israeli goods. And if that wasn't bad enough, some of Israel's worst enemies are its own people. How about this group, Jews for boycotting Israeli goods. It's kosher to boycott Israeli goods. Palestine Solidarity Movement released this advertisement. Boycott Israel. How many more die must die before you act? Here is Marwan Baghouti. He is serving five life sentences in an Israeli jail for orchestrating terrorist suicide attacks against Israeli citizens. He's the leader of the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigades. In January of this year, he sent a letter to an international conference for Palestinian prisoners being held in Morocco in which he said this, we must continue to act to isolate Israel further on the international, official and popular level and on all levels and in all spheres as well as continuing the campaign to boycott all Israeli goods, not limiting it to settlement goods exclusively. We can understand. It's a horrible thing to read and hear. We can understand that a man like that would want to hurt and hit Israel in that way. But when the church is on board with this, we know there's a serious problem. Here is Naima Teek, 2011. Now I see greater emphasis on BDS in the last three conferences. BDS means boycott, divestment, and sanctions. In the three conferences that we had, uh, we've had more people than usual. In Seattle, over 400 people. In San Francisco, over 500, they had to stop the registration. Uh, in Hawaii, obviously smaller group, uh, but people are emphasizing now BDS and feel that uh, that's the way forward. Naomi Teek, Stephen Sizer, the Christian Palestinianists believe the way forward is BDS. Hit Israel with boycott, divestment, sanctions. 
It's big here in the United States. You heard Seattle, San Francisco, Hawaii. They're just three. You could have talked about Boston and Washington, many other places where Sabeel, Christian Palestinianism, is very much present. The World Council of Churches, the largest ecumenical body representing the church, was founded in Amsterdam in 1948. It has never been a friend of Israel. It has always been a supporter of the Palestinian movement. It supported Arafat and the PLO in the 1970s. In 2002, it issued this document, End the Illegal Occupation of Palestine, to all its member groups. I think there are about 350 churches and so-called Christian organizations under the umbrella of the World Council of Churches. In Geneva 2009, the Central Committee of the World Council of Churches issued its statement on Israeli settlements in the occupied Palestinian territory. They said this, we call for an international boycott of goods produced in these illegal Israeli settlements in the occupied territories. What difference is there between what the Islamic world is doing and parts of the Christian world is doing in relation to Israel? So here we are in 2011. Boycott Israeli goods, don't squeeze a Jaffa, crush the, crush the occupation. Let's turn the clock back. It's 1933 and where are we? We're on the streets of Germany. Adolf Hitler has just come into power. He has instructed his minister for propaganda, Joseph Goebbels, to call for a nationwide boycott of Jewish shops and businesses. In Ecclesiastes, we read these words, There is nothing new under the sun. What has been will be again. We are in very dark, very dangerous times. And when the church, when Christians, when evangelical le leaders, never mind the liberal Protestant leaders within the church, are on this bandwagon calling for the boycott of, of Israeli goods, well, all I can say is they're on a collision course with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the Lord's return must be very, very near. Christian Palestinianism is forging an unholy alliance with Islam. There's your former president, the evangelical president, Jimmy Carter. His book, Palestine, Peace Not Apartheid. You know exactly where he's coming from when you read those words. There is Jimmy Carter embracing Ishmael Hania. Who is Ishmael Hania? He's one of the leaders of Hamas. He was elected Prime Minister in Gaza back in 2005 or 2006. All hugs and smiles. There is Jimmy Carter some years back. All smiles with Yasser Arafat and more recently with Mahmoud Abbas, the president of the PA, who wrote his PhD thesis denying the Holocaust. There they are in conference together. There is Ishmael Hanir again, this time with Desmond Tutu sharing a press conference. There is Desmond Tutu, all hugs and smiles with Yasser Arafat, the inventor of Palestinian terrorism. Suicide bombings come from Yasser Arafat. In 2004, a book was published entitled Speaking the Truth, Zionism, Israel and Occupation. It was edited by a Roman Catholic scholar called Michael Pryor, who described Joshua as the patron saint of ethnic cleansers and the God whom you and I worship as the great genocidist. In the foreword of this book, Speaking the Truth, Archbishop Desmond Tutu wrote, Now alas, we see apartheid in Israel. The apartheid government in South Africa was very powerful, but today it no longer exists. Hitler, Mussolini, Stalin, Pinochet, Milosevic, Idi Amin were all powerful, but in the end they bit the dust. You see the association? And so the Israeli government will fall just as these dictators once fell. Here is a photograph that was taken at the Mukhtar in Ramallah in Israel. That is where, before Arafat died in late 2004, that is where the, where the Israeli government 
had him held, confined. I was sat behind the man who took that photograph. Not as a sympathizer of Sabil, this was the fifth international Sabil conference that I attended in 2004, but the Lord sent me there to observe and to see with my own eyes what Sabil was all about, what these so-called Christians were doing. And the fifth international Sabil conference was headlined, Challenging Christian Zionism. There were 600 delegates, clergymen, theologians, peace activists from all around the world and from all the mainstream Christian denominations. There were 260 delegates from the United States. We were told, I think it was the second day, the first day was bad enough because I was sat there in this auditorium where the conference was held, just opposite the new gate to the old city, those of you who have been to Jerusalem, sat in this conference, it was a um, Roman Catholic pontifical institute dedicated to Mary, and in that conference I heard men like Gary Burge, Donald Wagner, Stephen Sizer, and Naime Teek condemning Israel, condemning the United States, and condemning Christians like you and I once again, who dare to stand on the word of God and say, Israel has a future. God's everlasting promises are everlasting. God's everlasting covenants are everlasting. God's everlasting love is everlasting. His love for the Jewish people, as we read in Jeremiah 30. And on the second day, Naimatik stood in that conference center and said, Chairman Arafat would like us to join him for tea. Well, I could not believe my ears. I had no idea. I was going over there as an observer. I'd just begun my PhD research into Christian Zionism, and I was sat listening to this man telling me that the next day I was going to meet Yasser Arafat. Now, this is how the Lord leads. This is just incredible. I still live with my parents. My parents are not saved. When my mom heard I was going to Jerusalem, she went into a panic. Because Jerusalem to my mum equals suicide bombers getting on board Jerusalem buses and blowing people to pieces. And in my front living room, before I flew out, I said, Mum, this was the kind of comfort and assurance I tried to bring her. I said, Mum, even if I'm in Yasser Arafat's front room, if it's where the Lord wants me to be, I will be in the safest place on this planet. Well, she's not a believer, so she couldn't say amen. <laughs> she just gave me a wry smile. And so the day I was in Yara Yasser Arafat's front room, I was thinking, I can't wait to phone home and tell my mum. <laughs> but this was the most surreal experience. I am sat in this place praying, Lord, why am I here? What am I doing seeing all this? And Yasser Arafat came on to the platform with Hanan Ashrawi in the center, Naima Teek, and Edmund Browning, the former presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church of America. And all these Christians and all these evangelicals stood to applaud Yasser Arafat. I sat down just praying, Lord, please help me. Please protect me and please show me what I'm to do. After they'd all spoken, Naima Teek said, Chairman Arafat would like his picture taken with every single one of you. Now, he's going to be at the door when you leave, so just file through the door and shake his hand and have your picture taken. Now, there was only one door into the Mukhtar, one way in and one way out. I'm looking over there because it was, I just remember it as being in that corner. And I'm praying, thinking, Lord, I can't shake hands with this man. How could I ever, ever speak to a Jewish person again if I shook hands with a man who is responsible for so much Jewish blood? But I had complete peace. Complete peace. I didn't know what was going to happen, but total peace that the Lord was in control. And so I decided just to take myself away and pray for a few moments as people began to file through the door. And I used Yasser Arafat's bathroom. That's my claim to fame. I went through the doors at the back, used the bathroom just to pray, and then I came back in, and now was the moment of leaving the compound to get back to my coach. An Anglican, an Englishman, based in Jerusalem at the time, came up to me, and I said to him, Tony, I can't shake hands with that man. 
Oh, but it's the English thing to do. I said, Tony, he is responsible for the blood of so many Jews. What is the Lord going to think of us if we shake his hand? Anyway, at that moment, two of Arafat's men appeared out of nowhere and they opened up this side wall, a wooden paneled wall. That's all it was, it was just a wooden panel to me. And they made a door. Me and Tony and this German guy didn't have to go past Yasser Arafat, through the side wall, up to the coach, back to Jerusalem. How the Lord had his hand. Well, at that conference, Yasser Arafat was presented with this book, Speaking the Truth, by Michael Pryor and by Stephen Sizer. But that wasn't the end of the story. I would not be here today. Tom was sharing in the first session about how the Lord has led him wonderfully through his life and into ministry. I would not be here today if it were not for the Sabeel Conference. My first visit to Israel. What the Lord showed me. And I'll tell you why. Because I was given, I was given an opportunity to stand for the Lord Jesus and for the honor of his name. And I was presented with the challenge, am I going to compromise by keeping my mouth shut and saying nothing? The penultimate night, the penultimate night of that Fifth International Sabeel Conference was a 10th anniversary celebration of Sabeel. And many church leaders were invited onto the platform and they were applauded and given gifts and medals and all the rest of it. By which time I knew why I was in Jerusalem. Before I flew out, my pastor's wife, Pat, gave me a word, and it was from Esther 4, and it was for such a time as this. And none of us knew what was going to happen at the Sabeel Conference. But I knew by that stage, the Lord wanted me to say something. And there were words that were coming into my mind. And so as I got to the conference center that night, I knew that at some stage I would have to do something and say something. And this is a huge auditorium and there's 600 people. At the very end of that night of celebration, a man ran up onto the platform, whispered in Naimitik's ear, and he then told us that Abdul Rantisi, the spiritual head of Hamas at the time, had been assassinated by the Israelis. There was an audible groan right through the auditorium. Atik then called us to take a minute's silence for Rantisi. So all these Christian leaders observed a minute silence for the spiritual leader of Hamas. At which point my heart was coming out of my chest because I knew that this was the moment to speak for the Lord. Because, you see, at this conference, they were praying prayers to the Lord. They were singing hymns to Jesus. Everything that they were talking about in opposing Israel and America and Christian Zionists was all done in the name of the Lord Jesus. And that was so grievous to me that our Lord's name was being used in that way. And so when the minute silence ended, I switched on my microphone and I began to speak. And I'll tell you what I shared, because it was all recorded, and this is what I shared. Now, remember Amos 7? When Amos, the prophet, was told by that high priest up in Bethel in the north, go back to Judah with your prophecies. And Amos said, I was neither a prophet nor a prophet's son. I was a, a herdsman, a dresser of sycamore fig trees. But the Lord called him to speak. Now the Lord has not called me to be a prophet. I am not a prophet's son. Okay, I am just a brother in Christ whom the Lord has called and equipped. But the Lord gave me a word and I stood up and I shared this at the conference. You hypocrites, you mockers of Jesus Christ, you distorters of the word of God, the word of his truth. You are in a house not built by Jesus Christ. You are in a house that is being built by Antichrist. This has nothing to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. You have been weighed in the balance and you have been found wanting. And those of you who do know Jesus Christ, the Lord says, come out, come out of her so that you do not share in her sins and in her plagues. And Gary... Urge. I felt this on my heart. I appeal to you. I appeal to you to come out, Gary. I appeal to you whom the Lord has troubled this week. Come out. You who shook hands with Yasser Arafat. 
You who applauded Michael Pryor, you are not Christians if you can do these things. The shame is on you and you will know. As I was finishing that message, those 600 delegates stood up and started singing to me. They didn't serenade me, they started singing to me very aggressively, we shall overcome, we shall overcome someday. But I had complete peace because I knew I was in the will of the Lord. I wasn't coming for a cause or spoiling for a fight or trying to make a name for myself. I was just trying, as weak and feeble and sinful as I am, just to stand for the honor of the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I was led out of the compound. Very graciously, Gary Burge was one of them, and Nymatik's son. They asked me what that was all about, and I explained, what you're doing is so grievous to the Lord. You are actually hurting the Palestinian people by doing this. You are not helping them. And I was shown to the... The, end, the, the exit of the compound which faced opposite the new gate in the old city. And I was staying inside Jaffa Gate at Christ Church, you know, the oldest Protestant church there in Jerusalem, built in 1849 at the guest house there. And this was Shabbat. This was Saturday night. It was 10 o'clock. And when I got to the exit of the compound, I was in floods of tears. Maybe with the tension and the, just the stress of it all, I was just crying. And I walked up, you know, wondering, Lord, did I do right? Did I make a fool of myself? Did I dishonor you? Was that you, Lord? So I walked up the road, those of you that are familiar with the old city of Jerusalem, and then down alongside the wall towards the Jaffa Gate. And as I'm going down, just crying, two young Orthodox Jews, all dressed in black with the tallit, the prayer shawls, they're walking towards me. And I looked up, and I just said to them, Shalom. And they looked at me right in the eye. And when I first shared this testimony, this is how I described it. I said, the voice with which they spoke was the most beautiful voice I've ever heard in my life. Because they both said to me, Mazel tov, And carried on walking. They're coming from the opposite direction. They haven't been to the conference. I've never met them in the in my life. They don't know who I am or what's happened, but they said, Mazel tov. I didn't know what they said. Mazel tov for me was just something I heard when I watched Fiddler on the Roof years previously at some wedding that's in the film. Mazel tov, mazel tov. It means congratulations, doesn't it? It's what you say to the bride and the groom. And, and so I asked three people independently that night and the following day, please tell me, what does mazel tov mean? And I told them what had happened and they scratched their head. He said, how, why would they say that to you? Why wouldn't they say shalom or shabbat shalom? And they said, it means congratulations. It's something that they would say at a wedding or a birthday or something like that. Well, that just set me off crying again. But the Lord, I'm saying this to the glory of the Lord, please hear that, and to your encouragement that when you stand for Jesus, when he calls you to make a stand, not to go and have a fight, but when he calls you to make a stand, he will be stood right next to you. He will give you the words to say. He will give you the wisdom to know what to do. And it doesn't matter how powerful, how aggressive this movement is or any other movement. If we are in the will of the Lord and we're doing our best to love him with all our heart, soul, mind and strength, then he will enable us to stand. And that might be a stand in your family or in your workplace or with your neighbors. Stand with his love, his compassion, his grace, but with his truth and his zeal and for the honor and glory of his name. And the five days that followed that Sabeel conference were the most blessed days of my life, including a trip I made for the first time to Yad Vashem. Very, very special days. Well, we're going to tie this up very quickly. I'm not going to be able to probably go through it all. But the Christian Palestinians, Palestinians are on the campaign trail. Stephen Sizer and this man, to his right, Porter Speakman Jr., they have produced an anti-Christian Zionist film called With God on Our Side. There is Sizer and Speakman Jr. at Pepperdine University in California presenting the film and presenting 
their understanding of the Bible, their understanding of what's going on in the Middle East from a Christian Palestinianist perspective. You'll be told as you travel to Israel that it's just too dangerous to take you to some of these places. But that is rhetoric that is employed uh, in order to keep you on the tourist trail. Palestinian Christians lived for centuries in this land. They struggled to stay in this land. And suddenly they meet Christian groups of people and saying to them, you Palestinian Christians are an obstacle for the second coming of Jesus. You need to move out in order to make room for the Jews from the diaspora to come here. It's important to understand that the Jewish have gone through thousands of years of suffering. But from that, two paths can be taken. The path of deeper compassion and mercy and justice and peace. Or the tradition of Berlin walls being built to exclude people who are not of us. We as evangelicals have endorsed an Israeli domestic policy that has placed over three million people under military occupation and has created the largest refugee population in the entire world. And you have to ask yourself, um, why is this defended by the Christian church? How it is it that we don't see the suffering of so many people? The implication of Christian Zionism, the way they understand it, the way we hear it here, is to accept this theology is to commit suicide as a people group. Of course there are extremists in the pro-Israel church who go way too far, who don't believe we should criticize Israel, who don't believe we should preach the gospel to the Jewish people. They are extremists and they are not lining up. I don't care how big their church is, how popular they are, how much of a friend of Israel they may be, how many millions of dollars they plow in to the Israeli economy. Our commission is to preach the gospel to the Jew first. Our commission isn't to be, you know, we're not to be the police, the judge of Israel. God is their judge. But we are to stand with Israel based on what the scriptures say. Not getting broiled in politics and all, the, all of that. So there are extremists, but all of us are being tarred with the same brush. And that's what these people are trying to do. That film has been on tour here in the United States. It's been shown at Wheaton College in Illinois, Harvard, Massachusetts, Princeton, New Jersey, Biola University, California, California Baptist University, Pepperdine University in California, Point Loma Nazarene University in California, and North Carolina State University, and many, many more institutions and churches right across America. It has been endorsed by Brian McLaren, one of the leaders of the apostate emerging church movement. This shows you how widespread this network is of Christian Palestinianism. It is a web. It is a web of deceit. This is what Brian McLaren says in his endorsement that is on the back of the film. Finally, a look at what Christian Zionism teaches, and more importantly, the real implications it has on the people of the Middle East. In January 2010, on his personal blog, writing from Jerusalem, Brian McLaren said this, This morning I'll be back in East Jerusalem with the good people of Sabeel, leaders in developing a faithful Christian theology contextual to the Palestinian occupation. While at Sabeel, it was a pleasure and honor to finally meet Naim Atik, whose work and writings I have long admired from a distance. The second person on the back of the cover of that film endorsing this film is Tony Campolo. He says, I don't know anything quite like it. I'd have to say the church desperately needs it. Here is Tony Campolo speaking to Stephen Sizer at what's called the Christ at the Checkpoint Conference in Bethlehem last year. And this is what Tony Campolo had to say. Uh, the idea is that uh, uh, we've all been caught up in this theology coming out of Schofield Bibles and Darby yeah. that suggests that uh, Jesus can't return until uh, the Jews are returned to the promised land. And uh, I think the scholars have ascertained that the uh, 
that John Darby and the whole dispensationalist movement basically grew out of the fact that uh, these people felt that the prophecies that uh, were in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible, yeah. about uh, what God was promising to Israel had not been fulfilled. Mm -hmm. Therefore, before the Lord can return, these prophecies have to be fulfilled. And uh, uh, so, uh, the one avoids justice in the midst of all of this. The one thumbs his nose is justice. That in short, the fulfilling of somebody's interpretation of the second coming is more important than justice. Is a, is an apparent concept in my thinking. Jesus can't return until these prophecies have been fulfilled, and it was an abhorrent concept to him that there could be Christians who line up with. John Nelson Darby and people like Cyrus Schofield in what they said about the restoration of the Jewish people. Um, well, there we go. So back to the film. Here is Stephen Sizer's church in England where the film was premiered. And it did its rounds in the UK, not just in the US. At the Nazarene Theological College in Manchester where I did my theological training. At Cambridge University, at Trinity College Dublin, and at Stormont, the Northern Ireland Assembly in Belfast. This is where the film was shown, in Belfast, Northern Ireland. Who hosted this screening of With God on Our Side? Who welcomed Stephen Sides and Porter Speakman, evangelicals, to present their anti-Christian message? If you look at that caption, you will have a clue. There's the clue. The Irish Republic to the people of Ireland. Sinn Féin was behind the screening of With God on Our Side. Whenever you hear Sinn Féin, you usually hear three letters immediately afterwards. I-R-A. On the 21st of November 2010, Nelson McCausland who is the Minister for Culture, Arts and Leisure within the Northern Ireland Assembly, said this on his blog. Sizer and Speakman are entitled to their views on Christian Zionism, but is there not something inappropriate about asking Sinn Féin to host a film about Israel? During the Second World War, while the Nazis were persecuting Jews in Europe, the IRA allied themselves with the Nazis. They saw Britain's difficulty as their opportunity and ignored the record of the Nazi regime. Stephen Sizer seems to be remarkably naive and ill-informed. His blog gives the impression that this was in some way an official showing associated in some way with the Northern Ireland Assembly. In fact, it was not. It was just a private event sponsored by Sinn Féin. Brothers and sisters, this Christian Palestinianist movement is sinister. It is not of the Lord. And it will not ultimately succeed, but it is having a devastating effect within the church. So in conclusion, one last slide. What is our response to be? In Psalm 83, we read these words. O God, do not keep silence. Do not hold your peace or be still, O God. They say, come, let us wipe them out as a nation. Let the name of Israel be remembered no more. Fill their faces with shame that they may seek your name, O Lord. And that's what I want to draw attention to. Pray for these men who are deceived and are deceiving others. Pray that the Lord would convict them of their sin, of their wickedness, of their wrong theology. Pray for the deliverance of people in churches that are caught up in this replacement theology, fulfillment theology, amillennial Calvinistic agenda that is seeking to hurt Israel in this way. Don't just get angry. Don't just get indignant. Go and pray like you have never prayed before. I believe there were Christians that prayed for Saul of Tarsus, who was hunting and hounding and imprisoning and putting to death followers of Jesus. I believe there were Christians. I don't know. The Bible doesn't say that. But I've often wondered, Lord, did you have your people praying for Saul of Tarsus and what did the Lord do to that man? And the people, the Christian community, were amazed. Well, if the Lord can turn Saul of Tarsus, he can turn Campolo, Sizer, Burge, Atik. He may not do, 
because their hearts may be so hard they may never turn. And that is up to the Lord to decide how he is going to deal with them. But our hearts must be praying, Lord, please open blind eyes that people may be restored to the truth and seek your name and bless Israel and not curse Israel so that they in turn can come under your blessing, Lord, and not under your judgment. Amen. For more information about the Berean Call and a free subscription to our monthly newsletter, contact us at P.O. Box 7019, Bend, Oregon, 97708. Call us at 800-937-6638 or visit our website at www.thebereancall.org.